any time that I was faced, and not just that, but then we had a hurricane in 2017, we had Hurricane Irma, and then we had the pandemic. I couldn't see the end in sight. I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel, going, oh my gosh, this is the end of me. This is the end of our business. But it was the hardest thing to get out of my way and get out of my head that it's going to make you stronger. You're going to learn something from this. You're living, your business is a living and breathing organism. It's not going to always be that white picket fence. Welcome to Beating the Odds, the podcast about successful minority businesses that will inspire, educate, and inform you. Your host is Mike Dewey, entrepreneur and founder of Hidden Star, a 501c3 nonprofit that has helped hundreds of minority entrepreneurs start and grow their businesses. Discover and celebrate minority business success with Beating the Odds. This is Mike Dewey, and on the show today with us is Jennifer Johnson in Naples, Florida, and she has a business called True Fashionistas. Jennifer, how are you? I am doing fabulous, and, and Mike, thank you so much for having me on. Oh, sure. Well, we're all about inspiring and, and uh, informing the next generation of uh, minority and women entrepreneurs, and you certainly have a great, great story, and can't wait to get to it. So. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, your childhood, where you where you grew up and those sorts of things? Sure. So I grew up in Minnesota on a dairy farm. I am the second oldest of six children, and I grew up with my parents working hard every single day. Uh, we would go to school and, and come home and do our chores, and as I got older, I ended up getting a couple of part-time jobs that I worked at as long as well as, as helping out on the farm. So we definitely learned a lot about hard work. And one of the big things was, was my family never had money to go and buy us new clothes. And I would always go garage selling with my grandmother on Saturdays and we would buy clothes and repurpose them to be able to wear them, which kind of ties into the why I started my business. But, um, so grew up in, in, a, in a farm family and learned all about hard work and uh, grew up and then moved to the city. It's funny how, you know, when you're growing up and I, I, growing up at a farm, I did not want to be there. I wanted to be in the city with all the cool city kids. And yet here I am stuck at a farm. And now I wish I could bring my children uh, back to a farm to grow up. So it's all pretty, uh, pretty funny how that works. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, but you moved one time. You, so you grew up largely on the, in the same house, on the same farm, and all that. So you didn't move around a lot when you were a kid. We didn't. We, my parents actually still live on the same farm that I grew up on. It, it, in wow. the rural, yeah, it's pretty strange. But I mean, in the rural countryside of Minnesota, uh, central Minnesota, that's pretty common. In fact, most of my siblings stayed close to home, and nobody veered off to do anything uh, different. Than, than what most of the folks do. And that's, that's, um, it's a neat factor, but it wasn't what I was choosing. Well, I've heard a rumor it gets cold in Minnesota in the wintertime. <laughs> yes, just a little bit of a rumor. It can be <laughs> below zero, like terribly, like it could be 20, 30 below zero in the winter. And, and it's just, I know anything under below zero doesn't really matter. <laughs> the number doesn't matter. It's still cold. So it can get brutally cold. And South Florida is a slightly different climate, I'm guessing. Yes. I traded extreme cold for extreme heat. I am in South Florida, and it can be 98 degrees in the summer with 98 degree or 98% humidity, so extremely warm. Yeah. Wow. That's a that's an extreme. So when, when you were a kid, was there anybody in your life or in your uh, family or friends that was an entrepreneur or a business owner and, and, uh, and helped foster kind of that ambition? Well, I think it was really my family because my dad was a dairy farmer his whole life. His dad was a dairy farmer, so it was kind of in the family. And I learned what hard work was from him and from my mom because my mom took care of all of us and my dad was up at five in the morning milking cows and doing everything else and his head didn't hit the pillow till 11 o'clock at night so that's definitely wow. where i learned my my work ethic wow and did you have uh any jobs off the farm or were you were you working in the family business on the farm 
So when I was going to high school, I was, uh, I actually had one part-time job in high school and that was at a fast food restaurant, which incidentally is where I met my husband, which is a funny story, but I, it was at a, at a fast food restaurant and then I was involved in a lot of extracurricular activities in school as well. So uh, I had a pretty rigorous schedule. But, but the first paying job was, was, uh, at a, at a fast food restaurant, which is, you know, great training i mean it, it, people people scoff at that but you know those places are orderly and there's a process and you have to learn things and and it's a really interesting way to way to come up for sure absolutely so so when did you come up with the idea that you wanted to start a business yourself so in the back of my mind i think it was kind of ingrained in me from from as young as I can possibly remember, especially in fashion, I would sit and go through all the magazines. Back then, I'm going to date myself here, but we're talking about Sears and J.C. Penney's and Montgomery Ward, all those catalogs. I would sit and look through them, and and then I I know that my family couldn't afford that, so that's when my grandma and I would go shopping. And uh, as I grew up, I seemed to get further and further away from doing anything related to to what I really wanted to do, which was fashion. And my husband and I and, and our kids moved to South Florida. And right after we moved here, I just went, you know, it's time for a new beginning. I need to do what I want to do. I want to do what my passion is. And I quickly realized that it was the resale and consignment area of, of business. And I did my research and found that nothing existed like what I had envisioned. And that's when I started it. So it was just out of a need and out of out of my childhood is really is really where it was rooted. And this is your first business. Were there any previous business or iterations of this before? My previous business, I actually owned a wedding and event planning business that I had for twelve oh, yeah. years. And yes, so I did. Uh, at, at one point, at the height of my career, I was doing sixty weddings a year by myself. And doing corporate events, so I was busy Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then I had my twins, and <laughs> realized I'm not sure if I can sustain this. And then built my staff, and then started a wedding, um, a, a bridal shop. So we did bridesmaids gowns and bridal gowns and tuxes to ceiling draping and all kinds of wedding decor that you can imagine. And then we ended up selling that once we moved. So I did do that. As well as I had a modeling, modeling and acting career on the side as well. Wow, you've done a bunch <laughs> of really interesting stuff. Right? Yeah, you know, I have it, it, the wedding or the 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 modeling and acting kind of. I was a former Miss Pete Minnesota, and it kind of parlayed from that that it was stuff that I started getting into the modeling and the acting, and before I knew it, I was you know doing stuff on Shop NBC and doing commercials and. And all kinds of stuff. So that was also a very good work ethic builder for me. It really taught me that to really rise to the top, you had to be dedicated and you had to be serious about what you were doing. Absolutely, hundred uh, percent. So, so you decide. Uh, so you moved to South Florida, and you mm-hmm. had had some you had some contact with with clothing and all that stuff in the wedding business. Sounds like. And correct. Uh, so, did you? Did it require a lot of capital to start, or uh, how did you finance opening a business? So, so that's a very interesting question that opens up Pandora's box because originally we had started it with a friend, a partner, and quickly after starting it, the partner realized that she didn't want to do this, and so she was the money and I was the brains, and so we scrambled to find the money to pay her off. To get that, you know, to, to take over the business. And we did that. And literally the next day, she opened up a store a few stores away from us and took all of our employees. So that, that in and of itself was also a learning experience for me. But basically we, we got to get, had to be scrappy at that moment to be able to buy her out on a whim like that. So, uh, wasn't easy. But it definitely built character, and it truthfully brought me to where I am today. Wow! <laughs> you weren't expecting that, right? <laughs> no, I mean, I, heck, it's, that's terrible. And uh, it gets deeper, right? <laughs> yes. 
golly. And, but, but you survived it and figured out how not mm-hmm. only to survive, but, to, but to move forward. Um, and, and how many years ago did you start your shop? 12 years ago. 12 years. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. And, and so, and the name of your business is True Fashionistas and you're in Naples, Florida. And at, at the end of the show, we'll give them information on how they can find you online and, 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 and Naples. But so 12 years ago, you had this, uh, this pretty horrible event with a former partner, but you got through it. You thrived. How long, how long did it take before true fashionistas was profitable? I would say probably within the first five years, we were profitable. And then, of course, we've had our ups and downs with events that have happened, like hurricanes and a pandemic. Uh, but I, I would say about five years. And how did you start getting the word out? I mean, was it, uh, you know, this is recent enough. You had social media and you had local advertising and all that. So how did you guys tell people that uh, there was this great new consignment shop in Vegas? Sure. Now, social media at that point was definitely not as robust as it is right now. So we, again, I'm going to use the word scrappy because we did get scrappy. I remember standing out at a local farmer's market, handing out flyers to say, hey, we're open, we're open. And we handed out flyers there. We put them on car windows. We did some advertising in newspapers. It was definitely more grassroots than if we were to start a business today. Starting a business today, I think, would be a little bit easier. We would just hop on social media and, and try to get the word out that way. But we created a buzz in the community, and, and we had some media here. Um, but mostly, it was definitely a grassroots effort. Well, I mean, who doesn't want to go buy stuff from Miss Beat Minnesota? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so when you were first starting, did, did you... I mean, you'd had your own business for 12 years. You kind of knew how to do the books and the filings and all that sort of stuff. But was there anybody in the, in the, uh, in the clothing, retail clothing space that you'd turn to for advice or guidance or mentoring? Well, there is now, uh, but not at the time that I started the business. I, I started it not really knowing anyone in the industry. And my husband was kind of a guidepost for me. He, you know, I could throw things off of him and that kind of thing, but, I never really had a whole lot of people who, who helped, but okay. right as this whole event was happening with the ex-partner, I had found a uh, score and they definitely were mentors for me right as that was happening. And, and I probably worked with them for a few years to get through that first stage of, oh my gosh, you know, this is going to, it's not going to work. It's, You know, she's right down the road for me. This is going to sink me. There's no way, you know, all the negative talk. They worked and helped work me through it to the point that I could be outside of that. So I would say SCORE was a big help. SCORE is is a pretty incredible um, uh, organization. And and just for the listeners, SCORE stands for the Service Corps of Retired Executives. And they are a volunteer organization that does a, a really remarkable job of helping entrepreneurs, want to be entrepreneurs, people that are in business struggling. Uh, they tend to be, uh, Jennifer, in my experience, they tend to be uh, accounting centric. It seems like there's more kind of retired accountants than just about anybody else in there, which is fantastic because yeah. they're really good and they're really helpful and they really care. So. Uh, for all those out there thinking about starting a company, it's S C O R E, and they're all across the country, and they're pretty amazing. They are. So, what is the funniest thing that's happened to you in your in your twelve years with True Fashionistas? Oh my goodness! Um, <laughs> I think the funniest was we go out to people's homes that are in the area, and we do what are called home buys. And if they have a lot of stuff or a spouse has passed away or whatever. And I remember driving up, this was early on, driving up to this gentleman's house. And for all of our listeners, I'm going to reference something from, gosh, it was probably a TV show from probably the 80s. Um, and it was called Three's Company. So if you have that thought in your mind, it was a pink Rambler house. 
And I, as I'm driving up, all I could think about was the Ropers on Three's Company. Like, that was my thought. And I drive up, and I go in, and the gentleman meets me at the door, and he said, you can take anything in here. Take everything. It's all, it all needs to go. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, is this all of your wife's things? And, again, going back to the Ropers, there was a lot of costume jewelry from the 70s, <laughs> a lot of kimonos and stuff like that. And and he's like, just take it all. And I said, well, my gosh, I, I'm so sorry to hear about the loss of your wife because that's what I thought I was walking into. And he goes, oh, sorry, don't be sorry. This is just ridiculous. She, 90-some years old, walked out on me. Uh, with a man that she met on the internet from California. <laughs> and I am like, I, I don't think I have ever heard a story quite that funny before. I mean, hilarious. But this gentleman, here I am thinking his wife passed away, and he's like, no, she didn't. She walked out on me. So that was probably the funniest. Wow. That conjures up any kind of, any number of uh, images. Um, so, You've been at it 12 years. You've, you've survived. You've thrived. You're, you know, all of that. There's a lot of hard things starting mm-hmm. and running a business. What's been the hardest? Um, I think it was when I had to face the partner leaving. And any time that I was faced, and not just that, but then we had a hurricane in 2017. We had Hurricane Irma. And then we had the pandemic. So if I look at those three big events, they scared the crap out of me. I had no I couldn't see I couldn't see the end in sight. I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I just had to go off of faith. And probably all three of those, I was wrapped in a fetal position for at least a week. Going, What do I do? Yeah. Oh my gosh, this is the end of me. This is the end of our business. And and you know, as small business owners, our businesses kind of sometimes creep into being our identity, right? Um, that's who we are, you know, like if you're, if you're raising kids, you kind of become part of your kids' life and you're now known, known as so-and-so's mom. Well, you know, you're known as the owner of True Fashionistas, but it, it all gets wrapped into one. And I just thought life was over after all three of those events and it wasn't, but it was the hardest thing to get out of my way and get out of my head that this can only make you stronger. It's not going to kill you. It's going to make you stronger. You're going to learn something from this. And you can take it the next time something happens because you're living, your business is a living and breathing organism. It's not going to always be that white picket fence. Something's going to happen again. Whether, you know, it may not be a hurricane or it may not be a partner leaving or it may not be a pandemic. It's going to be something that you're going to deem as a disaster. And you're going to have to deal with it. So maybe you've learned something from the last two or three times that you've been faced with it that you can use for that event. Yeah, we had a business owner on the on the show before, and he said about what you said. He said, you know, the thing I've learned is the cavalry is not coming. There is no <laughs> one coming. Yes. No yeah. one coming to save you. You have to save yourself. That's exactly Absolutely. what you do. Absolutely. So. Has the business changed or, 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 or the industry in which you uh, operate, has, has that changed since you started or is it all, the, the macro stuff is all about the same? You know, everything has changed. Um, when I look at my business, just my business, we have gotten leaner and smarter and better in our processes. We have an amazing team now and so much has changed it's it's made us better everything that's happened to us has made us better and our industry has changed so much it is the number one uh growing retail sector out there right now um i don't have the numbers in front of me but it's pretty staggering how much resale has changed it's not your consignment store or your resale store of yesteryear it is completely different. People are, are opting to shop retail and consignment before going to a regular retail store, especially, you know, with facing down our possible recession and um, inflation and, and everything's just so much more that people and, and the fact that they also want to um, have sustainability, it's just catapulted our industry to the forefront of everything. So when you first started your business 12 years ago, you were handing out flyers and doing, you know, one-to-one retail marketing and all that. 
How do you do it now? Well, everything has changed. We kind of got have gotten away from a lot of the print. We still do send out in all of our online orders a pamphlet and a little bit about us. But most of our marketing has moved digital. So we're on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and Pinterest. So we find that that works most effectively for us. We also do some radio, and then I also have a podcast. So uh, if, if you had to just roughly guess, what, what percentage of your business is online versus in person? I would say probably only about 25% is online at this point. We also do we do live Facebook shows where we do live selling on there. But even with that, I think most of our customer prefers to shop in person than they do online. So I would say it's about 25%. The, the social media stuff that you guys do now, is that advertising, just straight up advertising, or is it more like influencer type of stuff? For all of our, for what we do on Instagram and Facebook, we do some advertising, so we do run some ads. But how we do our ads is we basically take some of the Facebook posts that we view. So you'll see someone in an outfit, and then we'll take that and reuse our content uh, as an ad. So if it got really great engagement, we'll take that and we'll right. use that and put it in an ad. Got it. So 12 years in, you survived mm -hmm. three three horrific near-death experiences, and uh, you, you're back on your feet, you're marketing, you hit your stride, things going well. If you had to change one thing, what would you change? Oh, my goodness. Um, I would probably say I would have had – I would have tried to find the money from the get-go to do it on my own versus having a partner. Although that incident did teach me something, I guess I would have chosen to do it on my own versus having a partner. You'd be – stunned at how often we hear that. I am not surprised. <laughs> there are people who think they need a partner, and whether it's insecurity or they know what they don't know mm -hmm. and they, they want to buttress that, uh, but it's an astonishing uh, failure rate of partnerships. Um, so so good for you. You got out early. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So if, if you had to if you had to guess, which is more important to, to your success, ambition or talent? 100% ambition. You know, you can teach somebody how to do something, but you can't teach them the get up and go. You can't teach them the the drive, the fire in your belly, the persistence. You, you can't teach that. That is either in you or it's not. And I think right. it boils down to passion. If you have passion for something, then you're going to be ambitious. Yeah, well, talent doesn't fly you out of bed at 5 o'clock in the morning. Ambition That's does. absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So if you were giving advice to a young entrepreneur now, and you are, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> what advice would you give uh, to somebody who wants to start their own business now? I guess I would say get out of your head. OK, what I mean by that is, and I'm sure a lot of our, your listeners have heard of the imposter syndrome and I can't do this. I can't do that. Well, I'm not qualified to do this. Then learn it. Don't say you can't do something. Figure out how to do it. Uh, get out of your way. It's like getting out of your head is getting out of your way. Figure out how to do it. Don't um, or, or figure out somebody who can do it for you. So, you know, it's mindset. Shifting your mindset to, I got this. I can do this. Even though I don't know exactly what to do, I'll figure it out. Great advice. Great advice. Now, are there any specific challenges that you have faced as a minority entrepreneur, as a woman entrepreneur, that, that you wouldn't have faced otherwise or that others might not have faced? Sure. You know, as a woman, <laughs> you, for example, building out our new store that we did, you go to some people and they look at you like you have no idea what you're talking about and or you go to the finance area and they they look at you like you don't have a clue how to do this or even marketing. There's so many areas that people just look at you like, how do you know this information and how do you know how this works? So 
I think once they actually meet you and you kind of school them in the fact that, hey, I, I'm not an idiot here. I've done my homework. I know what I'm doing. I'm, I don't have all the answers, but that's why I'm here. So listen to me. Hear me out. And once they actually sit down and listen to you, then they're like, oh, okay, maybe they do know. But I think it's that, you know, you're a woman. It's still that in our society today. Do you feel like you, uh, the access to capital, growth capital, uh, is hampered because you were a new entrepreneur or because you were a, a female entrepreneur? I think it's a little bit of both because if you are newer at what you're doing, they don't see that you have a track record, you know, even though, for example, before I started this business, I had had a successful business. But it's a new, it's a new genre. So they're looking at it going, well, you don't have a track record. So no, 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 no. And then you figure out how to finance it on your own, right? Uh, and then partly because, yes, I'm a woman and my husband was not involved in the business at the time that I started it at all. He had no say in it. He didn't, you know, there was no involvement. And it's very interesting to see when you, when you start out and people just, you don't, you don't want to believe that it still exists out there, but it does. And then when it actually happens, your jaw drops and you just don't know how to respond to it. So, um, you know, I, I still think it's there, but I think it was a little bit of both for sure. So for, for our listeners, uh, whether they're in South Florida or they're in Boise, Idaho, but want to buy something from you, how do they how do they find you? There are so many ways they can find True Fashionistas. You can go to our website, which is truefashionistas.com. You can check us out online at uh, Facebook and Instagram, TikTok. You can check out the Fashionista Life, which is the podcast as well, and you can get that link on our website as well. Well, and they'll be able to get the link. Uh, when we post this as well, we'll, we'll put that on there. So, and they can buy, they can buy all kinds of stuff from you. All of it used, <laughs> right? Correct. We have, we have, we're a lifestyle consignment store. So we have clothing and accessories for men, women, and children. And we have home furnishings, meaning the furniture and home decor. And we have brands, everything from Willie Pulitzer and Lululemon to Chanel, Gucci, Prada, and Louis. And, you have stuff from a 92-year-old woman who went spin out. <laughs> yes, we did. We did. <laughs> is, all, is, is all that gone? Because I want some of it. I'm sorry. That is all gone. All the pink lucite bracelets and kimonos are all gone. <laughs> well, if it happens again, <laughs> keep me in mind. I, I will. <laughs> all right. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much. You, you're, you, you're an inspirational story. and. And uh, recovering from three near near business death experiences uh, just made you stronger. And, and it's great to have you on the show and, and share your story with our listeners. So thank you very, very much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening. We hope you were informed and inspired. Now we would like to ask a favor of you. If you could please leave us a review on the podcast platform and follow us, that would be great. And please share us with your network and help support minority business. Thank you.